games are all webs of interactions in some capacity. Even the most simple of them, like Pong, are like this. Every actor, in this case the paddles and the balls, is working together. They're all interlinked. The paddles move to block the balls, and the balls bounce off the paddles. This, of course, represents the tangled nature of our own life. Everyone in the world is connected to everyone else in some capacity, no matter how small. Fallout New Vegas is a mechanical web that is ridiculously complicated. So complicated, in fact, that sometimes it simply doesn't work, but that's rushed development cycles for you. Aspects of minor quests like bringing back together remnants of an organization that feels like it's only there to reference the first two Fallout games ends up paying off when you arrive at the climactic final battle and they show up to help you out. Helping a fringe cult of irradiated mutants reach their own personal salvation will give you information that you could use in conversations with important figures later about how rockets work. Even something as minor as getting kicked out of a casino can affect conversations with other major players in the story who have ties with those casinos. It's really impressive how it all came together, especially considering the workload they were under. However, there's something about New Vegas that never really clicked with me in a personal sense. While I adore the game's web of interactions, the characters just never felt real to me. There's no life to them. Well, besides maybe Raul. We love ghoul cowboy repairman guy. But overall, each quest doesn't really leave you with a feeling of personal satisfaction, even when they have interesting moral choices for you to make. Chalk it up to the lack of unique animations and the generally uninspired character designs that feel stiff and hollow. While there is some charm to the early Bethesda engine graphics, character animations are standardized so nobody ever moves in a way distinct to them, and there's only one real body type. Appearances blend together in a blur, along with very similar vocal performances from the same few people. There are a few games that nail this idea in a more personal sense, too. The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask is one that comes to mind. There's this realistic dread across everyone you meet, and you feel the ramifications that actions you take in certain side quests have on others. If you help the old lady at the bomb store and prevent her from getting robbed, you make it so the star-crossed lovers can't get married because the thief was your only way of getting their wedding mask. Essentially, wedding rings in this world back. If you listen to a sad man's tale by the laundry hole, he'll give you a mask that allows some chicks to grow up into full-grown heads later in the game through a marching song it plays that allows the chicks to blossom into adulthood by getting in line behind you for some reason. Hell, even something as simple as whether or not you wear the circus leader's mask, a mask that's an exact replica of the leader of the Gorman troop's face, can make an entire encounter easier because it reminds his brothers of him and they're reluctant to fire their bows at you. There's a whole slew of interactions and touching personal details like this in Majora's Mask, which is part of why it's still one of my favorite games of all time. Clacktown, the game's central hub, just feels real. Everyone has their own schedule, and because the game only exists in a three-day time limit, they can be naturally programmed to have incredibly granular behavioral patterns. It's really phenomenal that they managed to achieve this on the Nintendo 64. There is a game out there that marries these two schools of thought, though. One that is mechanically tight and where everything is tied together, while also managing to capture the heart that makes Majora's Mask so special. It certainly needs no introduction. It was one of the most critically acclaimed games of the past 10 years. Disco Elysium. There's so much to go over with with Disco Elysium. The political complexities of each of its principal characters who have their views meticulously defined, the way it handles failure and progression, or even just the way the prose reads and is so easy on the eyes. This web, though, the way everything ties back into the murder that you've been assigned to investigate might be the most interesting and emblematic quality of Disco Elysium as a whole work. Disco Elysium is about the connections we make in the oppressive world that we live in and how each and every connection ends up tying into each other in order to help us achieve our goals. On the first day, you can encounter a smoking man on the balcony who the main protagonist ends up becoming obsessed with, and you can choose to seek him out. What seems like one of many silly side tangents quickly reveals that the smoking man on the balcony had a great vantage point to possibly witness the murder. Now there's a surprise potential witness born out of what was initially a character's strange fixation. There are many interactions like this, and so many of them are wonderfully weird and personal. An investigation to a failing bookstore leads to an old woman simply trying to make a living making dice inside the bookstore's chimney who heard the murder nearby. Even something as seemingly minor as looking through the soup pots and what at first looks to be an unrelated hotel kitchen reveals some potential suspects' diets. It's all so interesting. Every little detail of the game can come back to your central hook. Exploring the game's world rewards your curiosity, which in turn rewards you with plot progression. No matter what the interaction, you are constantly being sated with interesting and satisfying interactions. 
Even when things aren't directly stayed to be tied together, there's still an ever-present sense of dread over the entire world of Disco Elysium that makes everything feel the same. There's a hanging, palpable malaise of a society that has attempted revolutions before, bullet holes left in the walls even after decades of reconstruction, discarded pamphlets and magazines of the communites that once were inspirations of the people who lived here. It's no wonder that all the leftist options for dialogue are all responded to with apathy and confusion. Nobody's willing to believe in such ideals anymore because they've seen the results of what a failed revolution can do. Everyone is completely demoralized. There's no motivation. Listlessness abounds. When you speak of how you're going to change things to someone like Gaston Martin, an old man who simply plays petanque with an old friend of his, it's hard to convince him that there's any point in change because to him there is none. He's lived through too much suffering without recourse to believe in the revolutionary ideas that you might propose. A world wounded without healing is a dour place, and the people in it are struggling to find a way forward. But that's not to say there aren't moments of beauty in Disco Elysium. No, beauty is everywhere. From the small things like sharing the view from your hotel balcony with your detective partner at the end of a long day of work to huge stuff like discovering ghostly cryptid bug creatures that completely shake up your scientific understanding of the world. Maybe even just a quiet morning as you listen to the drone of the radio go on and on without purpose in the hotel's lobby. Disco Elysium is a game with so much meaning and potential in it, but most characters have been burned so hard that they aren't willing to see it at all. When you find a perfect easel for an artist to paint on, a wall just around the corner from where she lives, she refuses to even check. There's no reason for her to believe you. She's too tired. At the end of the game, when you find out who is truly behind the murder, it's a huge shock because it wasn't politically motivated at all. It's just a creepy old guy who had a sexual obsession with the lounge singer who was the object of the victim's affection. This mundanity, the nature of the truth being so simple, really sells it all for me as the final nail in the game's coffin. The ironic punchline to the game's hours long setup. Martinez is run down and real and tired. What seems like a grand political conspiracy is just an average murder. So the exhausted land continues to linger. There is a sickness that brews in the Martinez district of Revachol. One that festers in all of its roots, but ends up bringing everything together under one thematic umbrella. There is no one interaction that feels unimportant. It's all worth spending your time on with least everything feeling so alive. From a strange thrift shop clerk who the main protagonist definitely wants to prove is on drugs with an obsession with Nordic fantasy media to a mafioso-esque union leader that can kill you just by making you sit in an uncomfortable chair, the world of Disco Elysium is peppered with interactions that entangle with each other in order to create a beautiful living organism. Even just the title screen, a scrolling series of clouds as you look over the whole district, is so tranquil. There is no Elysium after we die. It's in the world all around us. This has been Arcade Everlasting, who loves games that mucho texto, signing off. Thank you for watching.